It might get interesting. You're right, you never know, so I'll let it flow. Um, good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is Dr. Rationese Candy Tate. I am the historian for the Atlanta branch of the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. I'm also an adjunct professor at Atlanta Metropolitan State College teaching art appreciation, and I'm here with one of my students. Who's, tell, tell us your name for the record. Will Nicole Moore. And we're here um, on Wednesday, uh, April 27, 2016, in Atlanta, Georgia, at Emory University. So we've covered a lot of <laughs> educational institutions. So um, if you'll start with the questions. <coughs> okay. Bryce, can you tell oh, and I'm sorry, we, we haven't asked you, and your name is? Hello, my name is Bridget McCoy. <clears throat> I am a U.S. Army veteran of the Gulf War era. I served during uh, 1987 to 1991. Okay, and then okay. we'll get, get started with the interview questions. Okay, just do a little background information. <laughs> Where and when were you born? I was born in Los Angeles, California in 1969. Okay. Who are your parents and where are their occupations? My uh, mother is, both my parents are retired. My mother is, uh, was a county war employee and um, my, my father died actually after the uh, um, Vietnam. So he's deceased and my stepfather is, a, um, is also retired but he worked for, a, um, for Sears for an organization that so, so manufactured uh, uh, household goods. And if you could tell us each of their names. Oh, uh, Diana, uh, she's, her name is, is Diana Baker, uh, Diana Streeter now, and Charles Streeter. Okay. okay. Um, who are your siblings' names and genders, and which, which if any, served in the military? Uh, none of my, my sister, I have a younger sister, she did not serve in the military. Her name is Tiffany Floyd. Okay. That's your only sister? Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. What, are you, what were you doing before you entered the service? I was in high school. I was uh, in uh, San Pedro, California, going to high school at San Pedro High. And I thought that I was going to be in either arts or entertainment or computers. And I decided that <clears throat> the military would offer the opportunity to go to college and also offer opportunity to travel so I thought that it was a good opportunity for me to uh, leave Los Angeles and get to travel and see the world. And which branch of your, the military did you serve? I served in the U.S. Army. Did you enlist or were you drafted? I, I enlisted uh, during the time that I served. Uh, women have never been drafted so at, at this point but at uh, at the time that I served, I enlisted. I volunteered to go in the military. Okay. Why did you choose that branch of military? At the time, it seemed that there were more opportunities for travel. It seemed that I would be able to go into the particular job field that I wanted to mm -hmm. and travel the farthest with, with the Army. Mm -hmm. okay. Did you have any other branch in mind besides the Army? The Air Force, that was the only other. Okay. Um, what happened when you departed from training camp and during your early days of training? Departing for the Army, it was, it was bittersweet. My family didn't necessarily want me to attend, you know, go to the military. They wanted me to go to college. They thought I would, I had, would have better opportunities going to college. Uh, so they, <clears throat> my, um, Stepfather served in the military, and uh, the army. My father, who's deceased, served in the military. So, we have a strong military background. A couple of generations mm -hmm. back. So, uh, for a, a a a woman to go in, there was a, a, a different feeling about mm -hmm. me serving in the military. So, I uh, I basically thought that it would, it would give me some better opportunities. So I decided to go. I thought. Um, to ask me the question again, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, um, what happened when you departed for training camp and during the early days of training? So, during, so in, in my particular situation, when I departed for the military, uh, my family came to see me the night before I left, mm -hmm. and uh, then I went into the, you know, they come and get you and put you on a plane, and you're whisked away, and so 
you go from knowing everybody to knowing no one. Mm -hmm. And I uh, was stationed at uh, Fort Jackson. So Fort Jackson, South Carolina was where I did my basic training. And so the early days were maniacal. It was crazy because they, they yell at you, they, you know, get off the bus, you get there late at night, you don't know where you are, um, you're completely disoriented and tired, and, and that begins that process of um, inducting you into the military. And so uh, those early days were, were challenging because it meant it, going from being a high school student, because I had just graduated that summer, so being a high school student and going to uh, being in the military was a huge difference because you go from the teacher saying, you know, you have your homework to someone yelling at you to get down or get up or move or uh, execute some type of uh, procedure. So it's very, very different. Okay. What was the difference between West and South? <laughs> so being in LA versus... Yeah, California. so Los Angeles is it's very different. The things move much more quickly. Uh, people are, uh, you know, much, you know, uh, much more, if you want to use the word liberal, there's a, a lot less, um, people are religious and things like that, but it's not the main uh, conversation. Uh, the, um, it seems that the people who, from the South, because now I live in the South, it seemed that folks were much more family-oriented uh, as far as a big family. And so um, that was a little bit different. Uh, the, some of the women that I served with who went to basic with me, their family was coming to ba you know, basic training to see them. And we hadn't even been there a week. You know, and they couldn't you know, get visitors yet because we hadn't been there long enough. So that was a little bit different. Uh, the weather was definitely different. I had um, experienced being in the South. I have other, you know, I have family in Louisiana and things of that nature, so I'd been in the South, but never to uh, South Carolina. So mm -hmm. it was different. That was a lot different. Um, do you recall, do you recall your instructors? If so, what were they like? I don't remember their names per se. <clears throat> we actually have a historian online who uh, is connecting everyone who was in my my platoon and my company mm -hmm. um, together online. <clears throat> so I'm sure if I look that information up, I can find it very quickly. But I do remember <clears throat> that we had one drill sergeant who could not march the women, and so he, he his his gait was a little longer than everyone. So we would always get out of step. He would be calling left, and we'd be on right, going to left or coming from left going to right and I, I thought that was hilarious and because I thought it was hilarious of course that meant I had to be made an example <clears throat> unfortunately for him he didn't know I had a big loud voice and that I wasn't afraid to um, be in front of people uh, so he demanded me come out since I thought I could do it better to come out and sing cadence and I actually did sing cadence and sing it better and so mm -hmm. uh, that ended up getting me into more, you know, it was trouble, but it wasn't bad trouble. It was just, you know, light, uh, you know, doing more push-ups and having to um, be in the front-leaning rest position until everybody got into the, you know, barracks and things like that. But it gave me an opportunity to to shine in a, I feel like, a theatrical way because I, you know, I got to sing cadence and I got to march and, you know, drill and ceremony and those those things to me reminded, you know, were closely connected to theater and production and things like that. And, and that was an area that, you know, I thought I wasn't going to get to have, but I did get to have it in different ways. So, yeah, Did you um, have arts in high school or were you doing some I, of those things? I was doing some arts. I had um, been in a couple of plays uh, uh, from elementary all the way up to high school. Um, participating in you know artistic and creative things through church and through um, community, uh, I sang in choirs and those kinds of things. So I had been involved in in the arts, and I'm still very heavily involved in the arts uh, through the veteran communities. We have you know lots of communities that are doing those types of things. So, did you receive any specialized training? If so, what? Well, my uh, job field was data telecommunications which was computers and so I 
had to uh, be screened for a um, clearance, a top secret security clearance. And so I learned how to keep my mouth shut <laughs> and keep, you know, learned about, you know, when it's appropriate to tell certain information to and to whom. And then um, beyond that, I learned how to do my job, my specific job, which was working with computers, um, processing classified data, which was basically, it was basically administrative work, uh, our computer operations. Um, we had the big uh, tele the the data uh, like the tapes. Yeah, the big tapes. She may not <laughs> you know remember that. that. <laughs> I was getting a blank look for us. So I was like, I'm not gonna describe that right. <laughs> but yeah, so like in the old movies where they have the machines and it's on the, it's oh, a big okay. tape and the tape goes on to the next tape. Yeah. That's what I did. And so we had computer printers and we had what we call optical scanning units. You know them as like the grocery store scan. Yes. We use that to process data messages. And so that was my job. And so that I learned how to do that job in a way um, <clears throat> that would maintain my clearance and maintain the integrity of our um, nation's security. Okay. Uh, how did you adapt to the military life, including the physical, the... Regiment. Bet, bet, oh, I gave you the right. Physical regiment. Physical regiment, barracks, food, and social life. Barracks. Barracks. So, <laughs> social life wasn't a problem. Got that down. I, I, you know, I, at that time in my life, I was probably more of a social butterfly. I uh, enjoyed going places with my friends and doing things with my friends. Uh, adjusting to barracks life, to me, it wasn't a big deal. I felt like it. You know, everything is a give and take. They're giving me a check every month. I have to take this barracks and live with somebody in the in like a dorm room. So I felt, you know, that that was just part of it. Um, some of the harder things for me to deal with, um, one of the topics that most people don't like to talk about as it relates to military service is military sexual trauma. And within the, my first 90 days of serving, I was raped and, uh, and then uh, consequently sexually harassed. Um, through the time that I was serving by more than one uh, of my superiors. And so when I reported it, it became a hostile work environment. And that created some challenges for me that um, typically if you're adjusting to your uh, to the barracks and to the community, uh, you know, it's just you miss your family, you miss home and things like that. In my case, it was more of a... Uh, Concern for my safety, my general safety. Concern for where my career was going to go now that this had happened. And uh, a desire really to put it behind me and just move forward with the, with my career without it being a hindrance to me. Um, and an actual physical regimen of the exercise. And so the exercise... Basic pretty much took care of that. Once you go through basic training, uh, the the challenge the challenge is basic training is getting up every day and doing that uh, that regimented process of of you know of working out, marching, walking everywhere, and so pretty much they get you so in shape for while you're in basic. By the time you get to your permanent party, you're just like. I just have to run. That's all we have to do. Yay! It's not as it's not as mm -hmm. intense. I think for uh, the intensity of uh, working and your the length of your day is in basic. As you get to a, um, advanced individual training and what they call permanent party, where you do your job, your um, the the some of those things you know fa fall away unless you're in war. You typically, if you're in war, I'm sure it's a lot different. But I did not serve. Um, in combat during wartime. Okay. Well, and I just had one um, in through the physical regiment, and I know I've talked with other uh, female veterans. Just the whole hair, black woman. The, yeah, and the black woman hair the thing. Uniform and, and I was and I was Private Benjamin, so I went to basic with hair curlers and you know a blow dryer and all of those things, and I wanted to maintain the integrity of my hairstyle. <laughs> that I had left Los Angeles with, and and I and you know it was interesting, um, to say the least, uh, because 
at that point it wasn't as important what my hair did or didn't look like because we were in basic and you know and for the, for them I think they felt it was overkill with me but by the time that I got to a, from AIT to, to my permanent party it became an issue because there was a standard that was set and the standard was you know uh, European uh, straight you know non kinky hair and so if you so much as pulled your hair back or wore it in a style where it wasn't straightened then there was a question about whether or not um, you should go back and do something to your hair so I did have uh, I did have that happen to me once or twice um, where it became uh, an issue um, some of it some of it was part of the sexual harassment and some of it um, morphed into just regular harassment, har being harassed, um, just for, you know, finding anything, any reason to have something negative to say, so. Wow. Mm -hmm. What about the food? I personally think the food was great. <laughs> <laughs> I loved going to the chow hall. That was like the highlight of my day. I was like, the, the food is already prepared. I don't have to do any dishes. So what would be a typical meal that y'all would have? Oh, they would. It would just depend. They had so within the military, the way that it's structured, every job um, is either done by a contractor or by a, a person serving. And in, in my case, in uh, where I was, the military personnel were the cooks, and so a lot of the cooks um, they compete. They want. They get awards for their. They're, they're cooking. They go to specialized training to um, to uh, do things for the general and things like that. They, they it's, it's, it's a very competitive, it can be. Not everyone, you know, wants to excel at that level. But so, you know, you get up in the morning, you go down, you get your tray, and you walk to the front of the line, and someone says, what do you want? For, what do you, how do you want your eggs? And you say, scrambled easy. And you slide your tray, mm. and by the time you pick your other food up, your scrambled easy egg is ready, and you pick your other things up. So it's like cafeteria, but it's, you know, it was fresh. Um, you know, dinner could be anything from pork chops to chicken to, you know, um, meatloaf. I mean, it just depended. They, they, to me, we had really good um, staff that took care of us as far as our meals were concerned. I was not in the field, so I didn't have to do a lot of MRE things. My stuff was, you know, I was in a, in a controlled environment, so I could get up and go to the chow hall. And it, you know, and I lived in the barracks. So I didn't have, like you said, I didn't have to cook. I didn't have to wash any dishes. So to me, it was like a perk. It was like a trade-off. I live in the barracks. Boo. I get to eat the, the, the you know, you cook mess hall. They cook for me. <laughs> Yay. So it just kind of balanced everything out. So, yeah. <laughs> Where did you serve? So I served, so my permanent duty station was in Zweibrücken, Germany. And I also, uh, part of the time I was stationed at Zweibrücken and the other part I was stationed in Misa. Okay. And they're about 20 kilometers from, most people know Kaiserslautern, K-Town. That's the, the more popular location. I was further south, closer mm -hmm. to the French border. So coming from the United States to Germany, how was that? Again, I think I thought it was wonderful. I thought it was because uh, it was part of my plan. My plan was to travel, mm -hmm. to get education, get job skills, so it fit right tightly with what I wanted to do. So I was absolutely enthusiastic about learning about the culture, getting to travel, um, enjoying the music because it was, it was a different at that time. It was the '80s, so it was very different, you know, music, musically. Um, so I wanted to go out because I was 18, and there it was, you know, acceptable to go to the clubs and things like that at 18. So I was, like I said, thrilled. <laughs> How long did you spend over there? I spent three years. <laughs> okay. What some of the memories? You had, oh, Lord, I can't read right now. What are some memories you have of that you experienced? Uh, I have, so one of, one of my dear friends, uh, we've actually been friends almost 30 years, 
I met her in basic training, and this is an anomaly. It, it, it doesn't happen if you ever hear that someone served in basic and AIT and got stationed twice in their permanent party duty station with someone, then you probably need to sit them down and interview both of them because it doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. Even when people are friends and they leave and they join together, they get separated. Mm -hmm. And so um, one of my friends, uh, uh, Michelle, she... I actually met her and I didn't want to be her friend. <laughs> I wanted to just make it through basic and go to my permanent duty station. But she was very, you know, she was she was adamant we were going to be friends. And every time I'd show up at a new place, she was already there. And I'd say, oh, my God, this woman is still is, is following me. Um, but by the time I got to my permanent um, party in Zwipe working, um, she was just so thrilled to see me. I said, well, I guess this she's going to be my friend. And I just got to, you know, go along with it, run, go along with this. But it was, it was great because after I left the military and she left the military, we've, we've maintained um, a relationship. And last year, for Christmas, um, she came down from Michigan and saw me. And her daughter and my daughter got to another generation, yeah. got to spend time together. And so they got to hear our silly stories about being in the military and um, get to know one another. So, it, it, you know, those are the types of things... Where was she from originally? She was from Michigan. Okay. So completely, not from, we were completely different parts of the country, completely different backgrounds, mm -hmm. completely different. Um, we ended up with the same job field, but uh, just it was just very interesting that we were, um, we would joke because she was Caucasian and I was black, mm -hmm. that she would, that we were carbon, I was the carbon, carbon copy of her. And, but it was funny because I had never met anyone like, I never had met anyone that I felt so comfortable with that was so different from me, but that was so this much the same. Mm -hmm. And I thought I think that, that that's the um, most interesting thing about uh, the relationship that uh, that we had. So. Mm -hmm. And then before you move on to the other questions, and I want to go back, I know we kind of glossed over it, but certainly as much as you want to share about, the, so did you share with her your rape experience or what? What actually happened? And so, no one, um, <clears throat> no one knew, in in any specific terms, what happened. Mm -hmm. That pretty much was something I kept to myself uh, until um, February twenty thirteen. I testified before Senate about mm -hmm. sexual assault in the military and the challenges that uh, women, in particular, um, face. As, as it relates to uh, you know sexual harassment, I call it workplace violence. I think um, it's 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 a much more um, it's much better understood if we call it workplace violence than calling it something else because people don't understand what m military sexual trauma is. They, they, it, there's no frame of reference, mm -hmm. and so uh, she did not know, but she could tell because she knew how our friendship was before. And then at some point something changed, but she thought, well, maybe it's because she's more serious about her work. You know, when you have people in your life and they can tell something's happened, sometimes they write it off as some one thing or the other. And that's basically what she did. And that's basically what my family and other people did. They just thought, well, that's, maybe that's what the military did to her is, you know, toughen her up. And, it, and that wasn't it at all. No. It was really um, the not feeling safe in my